One delegation, the third delegation is not coming tonight, so uh, with that, if we could adopt the agenda. Okay, so we have one late item, which is our water rates bylaw, which I don't have here, so I guess we will amend the agenda to put that in. Second. Second. Hang on, just a second. Mm -hmm. Catching up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll just do this. Okay. Fair enough. So with that, we'll get uh, we'll get on with the show here. Um, our first delegation will be Norm for others and Maggie Hodge Kwan from the. Comox Valley Community Foundation uh, presenting the 2018 Vital Science Report. So, if you don't mind coming to the podium, and you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Mayor Grant. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you, Mayor Grant. Sorry. Yeah. That's probably your official title. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Um, we are, are thrilled because the uptake in the community will be starting to offer be doing a new vital signs this coming year to be produced in October of 2018. The first people were announcing it too. Um, but I'm going to just take a moment to, we are a, a tax exempt public foundation for the betterment of, of the people in the valley uh, for today and for forever through our accumulation of uh, donations, bequests, we have about $12 million now. And I think we, it's fair to say we are a trusted vehicle in the community to help enrich those lives. So um, I'm going to do one little plug. And this year we're giving out $450,000 in grants, scholarships, and payments out to the community. Uh, we've already given out 180000 to the agencies and designated funds. Uh, January. 30th, we're giving out 100, almost $170,000 in grants. <clears throat> and the scholarships will go through the high schools and NIC. So it's really quite dramatic. We're growing exponentially now in terms of our ability to support the community. In total, we've given out over uh, $2.25 million since two, 1996. <clears throat> we're now giving out about a million dollars additional every two years. Which I think is really quite <laughs> but the third element of our uh, purpose of our foundation is to provide, provide philanthropic leadership to help facilitate, coordinate um, learning opportunities, convening opportunities to help the community grow. We, we recognize that we are simply a conduit historically of uh, uh, financial support but we can also be a conduit for information. And two years ago, um, we, as you know, we produced the first vital signs for our community. Uh, what was absolutely critical for us was our two supplementary reports, which I, we now discover are relatively unique across Canada in providing all the supplementary data. So it really did, for, for those people, who wanted to delve deeper to support applications, know better what's going on in the community, they did provide uh, tremendous support. So now with the census data being much more rapidly available than uh, prior years, um, and the requests in the community, we decided to launch the 2018 Vital Science. And I'll turn it over to our project coordinator, uh, Maggie Hodge Kwan, to just introduce the project a little bit. Maggie. Excellent. Thank you very much, Norm. So a little bit of an overview of vital signs. I saw many of you nodding, so I, I know that some of you are familiar with the report, but this is a little bit of a catch-up anyway. Uh, vital signs are community quality of life reports that happen across the country. Community Foundations of Canada overseas 
the development and implementation of the program, uh, which is why you often see local community foundations taking the lead on local reports. Each year there are about 35 to 40 communities across Canada that participate. And like Hugh said, we're really excited that the Comox Valley will be one of those in 2018. Vital Signs reports use indicators and issue areas to, to provide a, a look at a community across key areas like housing, transportation, work and economy, food, and, and many others. Um, and they use indicators or discrete pieces of data so that we have comparable um, and quantifiable information over time to track our progress. As the slide says, it helps to identify trends and opportunities for action to improve local quality of life. So certainly we're here on behalf of the Comox Valley Community Foundation, but partners in the project include the Comox Valley Social Planning Society, who have reams of experience with this, the United Way of Central and Northern Vancouver Island, another <coughs> funder very interested in knowing what's happening in our communities, um, and North Island College, a, a fabulous addition to our steering community as well. So why do we do vital signs? Uh, we've pulled sort of three key reasons here. One, as a foundation and as the various user groups who read and, and put the report to use, it strengthens our understanding of what's actually happening. Um, always great to put some numbers to paper and not just rely on uh, sort of what the common narrative is or what the ranting on social media is. Um, so that's one. Number two, to inform and support decision making by identifying priorities. Um, so sometimes we're looking at what's going really well, where are there strengths and opportunities to build on those, and where are there opportunities to, to hone in on an area where um, some dedicated resources could really make a difference. And the third reason, really from a foundation perspective, it's an opportunity to connect uh, philanthropic and grant-making entities uh, with the different groups and needs in the community. So benefits of this report, um, number one, it's really readable. It's written to be understood and used. So lots of statistical information, but not written in a way that you need a master's or PhD to understand. Um, so that makes it actionable for those in the community. It's a catalyst for further engagement or research. Uh, quite often, uh, folks who read vital signs say, wow, I didn't know that. What are the causes of that, or what is that related to? So certainly a, a jumping off point to learn more. It helps organizations like the Foundation and the local Rotary Group set priorities. We would love to help local governments identify needs. It's a huge support for nonprofit organizations, and this is one we hear a lot, um, that we've compiled all sorts of great information. Um, cited it and sourced it properly and that they really rely on that in putting together their own funding applications and evaluation reports. Um, and likewise useful for um, getting funding from provincial and federal governments. So we're at the beginning of our process. Um, the report will launch in October, coinciding with all other communities in Canada who are participating. Right now we're focused really on community engagement, so making the general Comox Valley community aware, but also checking in with our many stakeholder groups, um, informing them of what's happening, asking for their feedback and input, so that we can uh, finalize our indicators for the report. Come February and March, we'll have a community survey out, and we'll, of course, be communicating that to you again. Um, and in October, as I mentioned, Vital Signs launch, and then some follow-up conversations after that. So mark your calendars if you'd like, October 2nd, 2018. We'll have the report, and we'll have the other documents that Norm held up as well, the detailed data and source report, and the quality of life survey analysis report. And you'll probably see us back here again. So I'm going to pass it to Norm again to end our presentation. There are three aspects. Uh, last time, your staff were tremendously helpful in providing us with data. And there's some benefit to that. The more Comox-specific data you have, the more we can look at 
including, so not only is understanding Comox, but understanding Comox in the context of, of the valley and, and provincially, so that would be a great help. Um, there are, we encourage all the citizens of, of Comox to get involved in the survey. This year we're going to be trying to reach out to more of the hard to reach groups that we weren't as successful in the first time. We've learned uh, where, where we need to approach it and one of the reasons NIC came on as a part the partners to help us reach um, youth in the high schools and at NIC so we can get their perspective on how they see the community evolving. And third, we're not asking for anything tonight, but once we do get all our memorandum of understandings together and our, our budget better understood, um, we will be sending you a, a, a letter of request uh, for some support, a relatively modest amount. Um, we're, our budget is in the order of uh, 25000 35 if we count all the in-kind support that's provided. The partners are, are part putting up um, <coughs> 16000 We have a bit of a gap to fill, so <coughs> we will be making a request to you, but we weren't prepared to do that tonight. So thank you. Uh, much appreciate you taking the time with us, and if you have any questions. Feel free to ask. Question. We still have ten minutes. We're just sneaking under the wire. Uh, you go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I'd just like to commend the work of your group. Is that uh, I know firsthand from sitting on some uh, nonprofit boards that uh, the data from your information on vital science has proved invaluable for grant applications and has led to some successful grants. That I know of and I've heard. Uh, for smaller communities in particular that don't maybe it's not as easy to access that information as uh, larger centers mm -hmm. uh, and as far as helping local governments identify needs i think that that is useful and is helpful too so commend your work thank you if i could add just a small bit one of their restrictions we've had as a relatively small community you know 20 years ago the data was only available by census metropolitan areas um, when we looked at it a lot of our health information was for the north island uh, this year, a lot of the census information can be broken down into groups as small as 35. And so we can look at mapping within the, within the Comox Valley, some more detailed maps of critical issues. Uh, and that will be fascinating to see. It's part of the evolution of how we can enrich the process uh, from our understanding of the community. Councillor Swift. Thank you. Thanks, Norm. Um, um, I'm happy to see you're trying to get a, a broader participation in the survey, and uh, I know as counselors we received it, and it sounds like you've got North Island College covered. But for people that don't fall into some of these obvious groups, do you have some strategies to broaden that participation? Um, yes, and Maggie will add to it. Maggie brings <laughs> experience from doing several in several areas. Um, one of the things we tried but weren't as successful at uh, last time, but we now know why, uh, is to reach out to the homeless through uh, groups like the, you know, the ones that come to the library. The library staff are willing to sit down with them and um, work with them in filling out the survey. And, that's, and so we're looking at exploring a number of those uh, different strategies of, of those communities that are more localized that we can go to are those people that don't use computers because we it's an online one and we did try using having paper copies available but that you know with limited success so we're looking at ways of um, encouraging groups to go out and contact people in their group and, and fill out the surveys so a, a lot of the will make that I think available to a number of the nonprofit agencies so they can sit down with their the people they work with and say we don't to fill out the survey. So we're looking at uh, the technology to make sure that we can do that this time. So I think we will be having a broader survey uh, than we were able to last time. And is there any thought of taking it to the Rotary Clubs, for instance, and having them fill it out there, that kind of thing? Um, we will be encouraging that. We will be speaking to Rotary Clubs and other groups as well around. Um, so we were quite successful of getting the word out for people that were computer literate, if you will, to click on and, and fill out SurveyMonkey. 
our, our barriers were more for the people that don't use the computer regularly, and how do you reach them? Um, so when we looked at the balance in the community, that's where we, we felt short. A thousand is still a, a lot of information on what the community wants with a thousand respondents, but we want to reach a broader uh, context this time. Okay, thank you. Councilor Wright. Thank you. Actually, you've answered my question. <laughs> but first of all, though, I would like to say vital signs. I've heard people talking about them. I know people are using them, and it's wonderful when you're having even a casual conversation and it's dropping the conversation. I think that's a good sign. And so I think you're doing good work. But also, very similar to Councilor Swift, I was wondering what changes you were planning for 2018. And I think, in essence, you've probably answered a lot of them. I think. Um, the, the two primary ones are how do we improve our survey capability and outreach, mm -hmm. and then secondly to look at the data. The, the last time we looked at it, we had 180 indicators available. We gathered data on 90. We used 70 in the report, but now we want to use them differently by breaking out the data more effectively within the communities. And the last time we also treated is this was our first time. My way of phrasing it is we treated vital science as a project with an end, a product at the end. This time we want to treat it more as a process. And on one of the earlier slides, you saw vital conversation. So one of the things that we're going to be trying to do this next time is take it out more deliberately into the community. I know it's being well used at the uh, Community Health Network, for example, and as they form, do their work. But we want to be a little more proactive in helping people use the data this time, I think. So those are the three changes. Excellent. I look forward to the launch. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. I just had one, one quick thing. I know last uh, time when the vital signs came out, um, we were hoping that we would be able to get some more Comox specific information. I think one of the issues at that time was about building processing time. And of course, we've made some changes to ours. The other communities had not. And so we got sort of the overall view, but we didn't actually get to find out whether ours had worked. So will we be able to get more Comox specific? You should. One of the, in our uh, quantitative data, one of the things we did was break it down by age group by and by geography, uh, by municipalities and so on. And so we should have been able to pull a whole set of uh, data for you around the responses with respect to Comox okay. and the data with respect to Comox. Now, it is building up our capacity as we grow as a foundation. Our, our staffing is, was very thin. Now it's a, still very small. Uh, but we want to build the capacity to be able to do a bit more of that. But we did have a fair bit of data last time. I apologize for not effectively getting it to you or your staff. Yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was just the report in general. And when that goes out yeah. to the public, then they go, oh, issues, but maybe not ours. So mm -hmm. that was kind of one of the things that we looked at. So I know, I know it's difficult to do, but. No, and we, we will. Um, and this, one of the things, again, building on your comment, uh, Councillor Grant, the question. One of the things that we want to do during the process is take out to the community one-page fact sheets around different issues and ongoing, so that we can address some of those things. So it's not just the single report we're relying on. So that's another change that we're making to the process. In, in our planning. <laughs> All right. Well, I opened up a can of words. Yeah. <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> that reminded me the last time. Um, when we had that, one of the comments made was that with the building industry, that the questions went to them during their busy time. So they didn't get a, uh, a real uh, a wholesome period of time to, to sit down and, uh, and answer these. So is that something you're going to look at? Is, uh, you know, time frames, uh, giving them a little bit more room? We can certainly, when you say building, do you mean the you contractors? Know, the no, there was there was questions to contractors as they were building in, say, the town of Comox. Okay. And um, as Councillor Grant said, that uh, it doesn't always um, uh, reflect correctly of what we've done in the town of Comox, gotcha. because maybe the builders in Comox got them during a, beer, a, a busy time. Yes. Yeah. We can certainly pass that on to Spark BC, who's our data partner, and they'll.
they'll be doing data collection uh, with the simple request that we give more lead time. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and we also can, with the survey data, um, make sure that community uh, is well served, if you will, in terms of giving an opportunity to comment on issues um, in the community. Excellent. Oh, well, I just to say thank you. It's a great document. And I know a, a good friend of mine who was raised in the Comox Valley, lived here all his life, he had a copy. He was so excited. He said, this is the best thing I've ever seen. I, I was, yeah. So he'll be really excited when I tell him there's another one coming. Excellent. So, it, so, it, and that's, so the general public is also excited. Thank you for giving us this time. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, so Thank are we you. going around again? Or? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks very much, guys. Appreciate your presentation. And next we'll have uh, Jonathan Page and Chris Durrupt of Anandia Labs to give us a 10-minute presentation on cannabis. <laughs> well, thanks, acting mayor and councillors, for your opportunity to speak. My name is Jonathan Page. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Anandia Labs. And Chris and I, Chris works for Macquarie, he's an engineer who's working for India, will address a development variance permit application that we put in regarding a, a property in northeast Comox, um, and this is a, an issue around stormwater. Uh, my job um, tonight, however, is to introduce the company and what we're up to in the cannabis space, which is always controversial, but I think uh, changing rapidly into a, a less controversial way. Just by way of introduction, I actually hail from the Comox Valley, so I, my company is based at UBC now. Um, I'm a graduate of Vanier, and my parents still live in the Comox Valley, and if you see it confusing yourselves, there's my twin brother, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Nick is working, doing some project coordination on, on this particular project. So Anandia Labs is a uh, leading cannabis science um, company in Canada, so we do lots of quality control testing for the licensed producers. So these are the Health Canada licensed um, growers of medical cannabis. Um, we also do a lot of work on breeding and genetics. So my background, I have a PhD in, in plant biology and I do biochemistry and genomic analysis of medicinal plants. Um, we are, the, the company in India is licensed by Health Canada. So we've had a specialized license since 2016. And we're the leading um, independent laboratory working in the legal cannabis industry. So we test for about 25% of the licensed producers. Um, these are the groups that are actually growing cannabis for patient use um, under Health Canada license. Um, we currently have a, a research and, and testing facility on the UBC campus. So I'm an adjunct professor there. And we have a lease arrangement with UBC. We employ about 25 people, and that's growing rapidly. The company was founded in 2014. And what we're looking to do is expand both in Vancouver with a laboratory site and into Comox with a breeding facility, a genetics development facility what, that we're calling the Cannabis Innovation Center. Just to sort of alleviate some of the concerns, this is not a sort of a Wild West free-for-all. We do this under license from Health Canada. So we currently have a license. The facility in Comox will also receive a Health Canada federal license. Um, it's not exactly clear the name of that license so reg because regulations are changing. But there's a, a huge amount of security around Health Canada licensing. So there's regular inspections. The federal inspectors from the Office of Controlled Substances come and look at our, our facility and audit it. All of our employees are, are screened for security, for example. Excuse me. The facility that we're proposing in Northeast Comox will not be accessible to the public. So it will be a you know, chain link fence or other fencing around it. There will be no ability to enter the site from the streets around it. It will have minimal signage, so obviously a company needs, a, needs to have something up to indicate where it's located. Obviously, no retail sales. We're doing research here. It will be a laboratory a greenhouse. It will be screened from adjacent properties by landscaping, berms, or fencing. That's still sort of be determined. There will be an immense amount of security. So fences, gates, alarms, cameras, um, locked storage vault for material. And air filtration from wherever the plant is being stored or grown will remove odor from um, the, the area around the, 
the facility. The main focus of this facility is the breeding of cannabis. So we, we know a lot about the cannabis plant, but essentially it's been left sort of ignored by mainstream science because of prohibition. So Anandia excuse me, is making sort of great gains in creating new cannabis varieties that will address grower needs, things like disease resistance. So you get disease resistance in tomatoes, but cannabis doesn't have that. That requires things like pesticides to be applied, um, new strains that can target specific medical conditions, um, and there's also the ability to propagate disease-free stocks, so plants that don't have diseases themselves, and make those available to, to the industry in general. So it's, a, it's really a, an attempt to, to build a, what could be a world-leading facility in a, in a rapidly growing area to employ you know, potentially two dozen scientists and technicians and, and cultivators in Comox. Um, we selected Comox partly because of the beauty of the Comox Valley and the sort of recruitment and retention potential we have there, the access to the airport, the fact that there's zoning already in place for this activity. Um, but I think it's, it's going to be a, an excellent opportunity for me as a company, but for Comox in general. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chris to, to speak about stormwater. Thanks, John. <coughs> uh, again, my name is Chris Roop. I'm with Macroindy Consulting Services Limited, and we've been retained by Anandia to assist um, with site servicing and stormwater management um, for this development. Um, so just a brief background on the site. The uh, location is uh, Knight Street and Military Row in Comox. Uh, it's about 2.6 hectare site, and there's no existing infrastructure on the site. At this time, um, as John mentioned, it is zoned for the proposed use of uh, mar medical marijuana production as well as research laboratories. So two variances are being requested. Um, removal of the provision for curb gutter and sidewalk along military row frontage and uh, an allowance to provide stormwater servicing per the preliminary report which was prepared by Mac O'Haney. Um, which follows the Northeast Comox stormwater management requirements. So here's a photo of uh, the existing frontage along Military Row. As you can see there, there's, there's quite a wide asphalt shoulder that traverses the whole frontage and allows for um, pedestrian and bicycle traffic. Um, as well, the existing roadside ditch provides uh, adequate drainage of the town's road as well as it promotes uh, infiltration and evap evapotranspiration, which is consistent with the um, town's objective for the Northeast Comox neighborhood with respect to stormwater. <coughs> um, as, as such, the Nandia is requesting um, that there's no requirement to, to upgrade to curb better and sidewalk along the uh, military road frontage. For stormwater management, the uh, property is located in the Northeast Comox neighborhood. Uh, the property generally drains towards Military Row and the roadside ditching, um, where it's collected there and, and crosses under Military Row and eventually um, into the Queen's Ditch drainage. Um, a preliminary stormwater management plan was developed, which follows the requirements of the draft Northeast Comox stormwater management plan. Um, to meet the key objectives of that plan, which are essentially is to have the post-development runoff meet the pre-development, uh, both in peak rate and total volume. Um, but the overall intent here is to, uh, is to maintain the existing runoff patterns post-development. The stormwater infrastructure required to, to meet these criteria is uh, two pieces. There's infiltration trenches, which are shown in green on the map here, located in the <coughs> proposed located in the south of the property, and a temporary detention pond shown in blue here. Um, the areas shown are preliminary sizing, um, and they'll be refined through the detailed design process. But uh, they've been laid out there to give you an idea of, of the coverage of the site required. Um, the infiltration trenches, once constructed, would be town owned and operated and located in an extension of the military row, road dedication, <coughs> um, as required by the town. 
The temporary pond will be on private property, but it will be owned, or, sorry, be operated and maintained by, by the town. Once a permanent detention pond is constructed downstream of the property, the temporary pond will be decommissioned. To facilitate the proposed stormwater management features, the following has been requested. Um, a restrictive covenant established on the land enclosing the pond area to allow the town to monitor, operate, and maintain the stormwater pond. Annual funding from Anandia to compensate the town for monitoring and maintenance of both the temporary pond and the infiltration galleries. <coughs> Once a town pond is conducted downstream, the temporary detention pond will be decommissioned at Anandia's expense and a restrictive covenant modified. Uh, Anandia Labs will pay a fee to connect to the downstream stormwater pond, as well as ongoing annual fees for operation and maintenance of both the remaining infiltration galleries in the military road, road dedication and the downstream detention pond. Uh, again, just to summarize, the, the provided areas are preliminary at this time and they will be updated to the detailed design process. And that's it. Anything that's to add? it. Again, thanks. Any questions from Councilor Arna? Thank you, gentlemen. Um, and I know we're here just to, uh, to, to uh, discuss the variance, but since you uh, brought up the overall um, issue of the uh, of the, the lab, the, the, the plant, I just had a couple questions. Um, what you, what's your plan with the waste byproduct that you have there? Does that get uh, incinerated? Does it go into the landfill? Uh, what happens there? Right. So as it stands now, Health Canada's regulations are that it needs to be destroyed, and mm -hmm. typically that's incineration. It can be composted on site to render it um, unusable as a drug. Um, and so that's typically with the licensed producers that they're using a composting facility or incineration. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of environmental sort of sustainability, we'd aim for a, an enclosed composting system, so not open air with the smell, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. enclosed. Yeah. And, and so the smell, just one last comment. So you say you will be providing measures to control the odor, because many of us know that it, it is quite a, a strong odor. So there won't be that in the air? Because I know, you know, the military housing, there's about 252 houses just kitty corner to that. There is going to be, you know, eventually northeast woods areas that become built up. There's going to be homes in there. So so we're pretty satisfied that uh, yeah, the Yeah, so will be again, I, I can sort of... Um, go to the Health Canada regulations, which are absolutely order control is sort of on the top of their list. Right. So things like charcoal filters, other filtration systems that remove odor, you know, exhaust air from a greenhouse will be filtered before mm -hmm. it's exhausted. So it's, it's absolutely minimized. Um, there are, you know, some obviously setbacks from existing housing. I can say that, you know, one licensed producer, one of the, the large growers, um, in Ontario, I mean, it's essentially behind a Tim Hortons. Right. right. It's a commercial greenhouse that used to grow tomatoes directly behind a commercial Helps them sell donuts. Helps them sell donuts. <laughs> 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 the points are right there. That's <laughs> <laughs> a genius market. <laughs> um, I mean, many of these sites, um, there's one at, at Duke Point um, okay. uh, by the, the drive past that when you go to the Duke Point ferry okay. terminal, and so it's it's, mm -hmm. it's not residential but other industrial. Yeah. So order control is definitely yeah, good. Possible. Thank you very much. I, uh, you, you, you kind of answered my question because it was around odor, but uh, I'd like to say welcome. Um, so we wouldn't anticipate that the odor would go beyond your property, I guess. This. Right. I mean, it, and, it will be minimal even on our property in the yes. sense of, you know, you, you do open the door from time to time, a little waft comes out, but the, the air <coughs> exhausting the building, the, box, the greenhouse will be, yeah, so I can say yes. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. And Councillor Grant. Yes, thank you. It seems odors are very favorite topic tonight. <laughs> That's where my question is going to come to. You have the lab in Vancouver, UBC. Right. Have you had experience with the incineration there? And, and if so, what about the smell? So the destruction, so we do deal with odor there. It's a, it's a laboratory that has more sort of air handling, things like 
few hood vents to this to the roof, which would be sort of standard in chemistry labs. So odor there is a little easier to deal with just because of the building infrastructure. Um, but certainly we we um, we have similar sort of charcoal filters to, to remove the odor from the air in the laboratory. Um, in terms of the incineration, we actually destroy using an alternative process right now. So we, uh, you know, there's a variety of things Health Canada allows us to do. One of the simplest is to grind up the dry cannabis that's sort of the residual from the testing process. We mix it with soap and water and put it with kitty litter and then it's bagged. And then it's at, that renders it unusable as a drug as far as Health Canada is concerned. And it goes just into a dumpster. Um, so, but that's mainly because we're dealing with analytical lab quantities of the plant. Kitty litter is not going to be possible in a, in a large facility. Okay. Does that answer your question? I think so. Thank you. Councillor Hugh. Yes, uh, just two questions. First of all, uh, certainly from a number of residents, uh, uh, I think, I wish they were here to hear your presentation because I think their impression going in was that it was a commercial strictly a commercial operation, uh, not related to the University of British Columbia doing testing for a testing research lab. Uh, whether that changes opinion or not, I'm not sure, but uh, certainly that, uh, that gives a different sort of sense of what the place is all about. And secondly, my second question is, is to staff. Uh, you, I think you gave a, a pretty good Reader's Digest version of, uh, of how the special design uh, the applicant will deal with the capacity issues of Queen's, Queen's Ditch. And I wonder if staff have had a good chance to look at that and, and uh, uh, whether they agree with the, uh, what's been presented here this evening and presented to you previously. Well, I know Mark, um, yes, we've been ongoing um, working with um, the property owners group um, on the Northeast Comox Stone Water Management Plant. Um, and this is um, consistent with that approach. Um, we're currently mm -hmm. in the final stages of hope that um, SWMP comes forward probably within the next month. Okay. Marvin is going to be giving us a little dog and pony show on this later, so. <clears throat> and if I could just make a remark around the sort of concerns of residents. Certainly, and I hope the presentation made it clear, this is not a retail oriented operation at all, and it would never be such. This is not the kind of company we are building here. Um, and, you know, with, with screening and landscaping and fencing, it will be very, I mean, there's a greenhouse, there's a building back there, but it won't be a conspicuous impact on the neighborhood, and certainly people won't be saying, you know, there's cannabis there, I can walk up and see it. So. Thank you. Councilor Price. Yes, and a very good presentation, and I think you've covered all the points. Um, and you're probably aware that there was some concern coming out of the base with your juxtaposition to them. Uh, so we did receive an email. Uh, I don't know if you've been privy to it. You've covered all the uh, items in your presentation, the visibility from the road, um, will it be accessible, and, uh, and older. So um, I, I, you might want to copy just for um, that so data. But I think you've covered all those points in that, that, uh, that they had concerns on. Right. Um, I mean, in terms of the last point there, proposed location adjacent to residential, is there an alternative? I mean, certainly with the zoning in place for this activity, that's that's why we're coming to Comox. We, we, you know, also, the, the beauty of Comox, etc., but the zoning is in place for that person. And I'm personally very excited that you've come. I think it's a really good use of the land, and uh, and, uh, and and that we're on the edge of it here. And yeah. So um, I'd like to say welcome. Good. Thanks for your support. Well, just have one more question. Yeah, and I just just on right? the tail of Councillor uh, Price's comment there. Uh, you know, as I mentioned when I, I, I mentioned my question, um, we're not here to debate whether or not that's the right thing for that because the zoning is there, you have the right thing to go there. Um, I just had a couple questions because you you opened that up, yeah. but I, I do think that um, 20 years from now we're going to look back and uh, this is going to be a, a normal type of thing. We're moving into a new era and I think we're fortunate in Comox to be on the leading edge of a company and a group as yourself and uh, 
bringing in some, you know, high-end jobs to the valley, it, it only bodes well for us. So, thanks. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much, guys, for coming. It's a great presentation. It's uh, always nice to see some Valley locals come back and bring their business to our community. We, that's always a good thing, and we will be debating this a little later uh, in the agenda. So, thank you. All right, so moving on to minutes of meetings, we have the uh, regular council minute meetings for December 6th for approval. No. Second. And any discussion? All those in favor? And then we have committee of the whole meeting minutes for December 13th for receipt. No. Second. And discussion? See none all those in favor? We have uh, committee recommendations. So we have the updated strategic plan for approval. And discussion. And seeing no discussion, all those in favor? And that's passed. And then we have committee of the whole meeting minutes for January 10th for receipt. Second. And discussion. No discussion. All those in favor? Gary. We then move down to the committee recommendations and we have the proposed 2018 flat rate for water increase. Second. Second. And discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor? And that's carried. We move on to boundary extension requests for Torrance Road. Come with that. Second. And discussion. Councillor Price. I just had um, a little bit more of a question on the hill that's being proposed to be removed. Is this entirely on the property, on the private property, or does this also include the road? That over to, who wants to answer over there? Uh, I think you're referring to the hump that we were thinking that should be removed. Is yes. it in the road dedication? I don't know without doing design if there would be maybe some regrading needed on the private property as well, but the goal was to get that, to improve the sight lines and the safety of that of the road. So it's basically removing the first hump. In the road itself, yeah. But that might come with some regrading on, private, on the parcel as well. Okay. And so that would entail taking down the uh, roadside trees too? Uh, yeah, again, without looking at the design and seeing what, because it is quite a grade there, so there might be some removal that would all be taken into consideration when we look at the design or if that even comes forward. <laughs> It's just that it's such yeah. a beautiful road, and um, I, I drive it nearly every day, and uh, I would just hate to see that we change it in a way that uh, and make it into a, an urban entry to Point Holmes, whereas at the moment it's a rather spectacular rural entry. So, uh, so that's why my hesitancy of supporting this, and particularly if it's the, the hill is coming off, Falkins Hill is coming off the private land, then that beautiful dogwood is uh, gone, which was very much admired through the decades. Robert Philberg used to go and photograph it. So um, I'm just, yeah, so to, so they would be able to develop the land without flattening it? Is that? Um, well, I think that was just an opportunity that if we could maybe see if we can get some funding through the boundary extension to remove it, because we do get a number of complaints and we able to right now pull them off to Amcon and Ministry of Transportation but and then with the more, more growth happening in there I think the maybe the complaints and the concerns is just going to increase um, with the set lines as you know by living in that area there's quite a bit of wildlife corridor in there as well um, so all that's just going to add to you know additional safety concerns and with the weather sometimes with the ice and snow and if, you're, if there's going to be some side streets coming off of that as well, um, sight lines might need to be improved. So it's so just preliminary at this point and again until, I mean obviously we can save some of the more mature trees and part of the design <coughs> that would be taken into consideration at that time for sure. So it would be seen that there would be access onto Lazo rather than onto Torrance? I believe so, yeah, that's what would come up. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite a, yeah. a hill and a dip. Yeah. I mean, it's quite a, yeah, I'm always very reluctant when you start removing geographical features. So, uh, as I say, I, 
And as you're aware, I mean, obviously there's that marsh area there too that we would have to take into consideration and the impact that's going to have. And that's going to be part of the stormwater management plan that we look at too. So that all kind of, all we have to take into consideration when we look at that. And that wetland, is it all in the road right away? Um, most of it, I believe, is on the parcel. Um, again, I'm not, I don't have much information on it because it's outside of our boundary at this point, but I'm just sort of aware of it. So that was sort of the one of the things that we want to get a better understanding of that wetlands and, and to complete the stormwater management plan to take that into consideration and what impacts this is going to have on it. So because King Road actually extends uh, and opens uh, through where the marsh is, is that not correct? And we would be able to keep all the wetlands, is that um, foreseen in the, in, the proposal, in the future thoughts on this development? Yeah, again, I mean, we'll just take that into consideration. We'll have probably the biologists involved and in, in that be all part of the stormwater management plan. What impact that would have on it, what we need to retain, how we're going to retain it. All those questions will come up at that time. Yeah, as I say, it's one of my yeah. most favorite vistas, and so I would hate to think that we <laughs> produce something that's very mediocre and as a result of that. Uh, and I think that a lot of definitely come back to council, right, with the design and what that cost would be and what that implication, and, and then further discussion would be happening on that at that time. Um, Great, thank you. All right. Anyone else? All those in favor? And that's carried. Uh, no committee reports, unfinished <coughs> business. We have the management report for receipt. Mm -hmm. And any questions, comments? Yeah. Council, I want to call you director so it's council. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, 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 to the end of this process. Smart. Um, well, I, think I can speak to that. I, I think we are nearing the end of the uh, final version in terms of edits between the town and the consulting engineer. What remains once the document is complete, uh, the consultants will take the document and get it. Uh, stamped by, I think, both an agrologist and a biologist. And once that process occurs, the document will be formally submitted to the town. Uh, council will then get a uh, receipt of it. Uh, processes still yet to occur are then going to be a public process or an open house held by the consultant and inviting uh, the community at large to view the document as well as make comment and, and ask <coughs> questions. The staff will be part of that process as well, I believe, or at least an observer, correct, Marvin? And once that process has been completed, then it will be uh, submitted to the town in its uh, final phase, and then we can begin the processes we need to do in terms of developing the bylaws that are yet to be done, soil retention, Stormwater bylaws, uh, local service areas, and everything else that comes into play. So you're looking at receiving that, we're estimating early spring, March, April. And would that be the formal, the, the first formal submission with the stamps that you're talking about? Yes. That would be the beginning of that? Okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. So. I guess the and then the bylaws. Is there any way to consider crafting these bylaws just to hurry this along a little bit? Uh, this is going to be resource heavy on the town, so we also have to gear up with additional staffing to actually draft those documents and uh, run that process through. So you're looking at uh, having that come forward about September time. Thank you. Anything else? Not seeing any. All those in favor? <coughs> That's carried. We'll move on to special reports. The Comox Valley Regional District <coughs> meeting minutes of Tuesday, December the 12th. 
Second. And any discussion? All those in favor? That's carried. And we'll move on to new business, which is Planning Report uh, 1710 for first, second, and third reading. So moved. Second. Second. And discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor? That's carried. And oops, I just got lost here. Where was that? Now I've got to wait for my screen to find its way again. Yeah, okay, so we are on to uh, BC Physical Literacy for Communities Initiative Program, and uh, they're looking for a letter of support. So, I'll do that. And discussion? And just, um, yeah, this correctly. came out of the Integrated Transportation uh, Select Committee of which I represent the town. And um, we did have this project in the valley a number of years ago. It was very successful. And uh, I think the spin-offs from uh, the work done in Comox uh, are helpful to the wider community looking at uh, routes, safe routes, cycling and walking to and from our schools is also a safe route for everyone. So um, uh, I think it'd be great if the school board can get the money and, uh, and uh, restart the program. So again, just briefly, it's a win-win it's a situation in my view, and I understand that the grants are available now, but uh, the application deadline is coming up shortly, so this would be very helpful. Okay, and then Councilor Grant. No. I nope, you're done? All the okay. Is it. okay, anyone else? All those in favor? That's carried. We'll move on to the Development Variance Permit Application DVP 18-1. And Marvin, are you going to give us a development phone Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, as discussed, um, we have Development Variance Permit Application DVP 18-1 uh, before us um, regarding property. Uh, at the corner of Military Road and Lake Road. The presentation outline uh, is broken down into three parts. Uh, first being an application summary, followed by location and land use context, um, and then the subdivision development service and time lot implications. That's related specifically to what the application is proposing here. Um, so, um, I'll try and keep it brief since a lot of these items were addressed in the applicant's proposal. Um, the development variance permit is in regards to our road specifications, particularly the sidewalk and curbing, and also our storm water servicing specifications. Uh, the proposed development is the Cannabis Innovation Center, and it's a phased development to include greenhouses, laboratories, and administration offices. The OCP land use designation, so you're looking at property right here from the Horseshoe property, is light industrial. Um, what I want to focus on there is the intent that land use designation is intended to accommodate clean, sustainable light industry, specifically to diversify the local economic base and create new employment, and that comes into play in terms of the implications of the development variance permit application for you. It's in three development permit areas. Um, development permit areas 7 and 16 are environmental and in accordance with uh, past practice. Those we process at the staff level. Light industrial, um, it's a natural form and character, um, development variance, per, uh, sorry, form and character, development permit. Um, given that uh, industrial typically has a lower complexity and visibility than residential or commercial, um, staff are intending to process that at a staff level at this time unless new information as to its complexity or visibility uh, becomes evident that would warrant council processing. The current zoning is I-2.1, proposed use is in keeping with the I-2.1 aeronautical industrial. The um, development variance permit, so break it down according to uh, road versus storm. Um, so military road was designated uh, arterial, it's an arterial road in the official community plan. Um, the property's frontage is approximately 240 meters on military road. 
Um, the arterial road specifications in the subdivision development servicing bylaw require the provision of a sidewalk on at least one side from vertical um, curves. Currently, there is no sidewalk or curves um, on the portion of military road that abuts the subject property, and we have no plans, for, for example, in our, in our capital plans or uh, infrastructure renewal plans for their installation at this time. Regards stormwater, um, the subdivision servicing bylaw has a clause that states where existing downstream drainage facilities are inadequate to handle the increased flow from a pro uh, proposed development, a special design is required. The subject property, along with all of Northeast Comox, drains into Queen's Ditch, uh, which has known capacity problems and known flooding, um, which is the reason why the town uh, is working with um, property owners in the area to develop the Northeast Comox stormwater management plan. The proposed variance uh, that you have before you, in other words, the stormwater servicing plan the applicant proposes, is in keeping with the design principles of the Northeast Comox stormwater management. Um, this actually represents a, a, a new approach to a much more comprehensive approach to stormwater management than has been done in the past. And for that reason, SAP did not feel comfortable approving that on an administrative level under the existing allowance for a special design. Um, typically, special designs, we would use that for modification of existing specifications for um, piping in regards to the facility or a simple standalone uh, detention facility but not something of this magnitude, so it will be much more appropriate to bring it forward to council. As the applicant, uh, as the engineer noted, the Northeast Comox Stormwater Management Plan is based on the provision of town-owned and operated infiltration and detention facilities to mitigate downstream uh, impacts on uh, flood and environmental uh, proposed development, and that's in relation to a natural vegetative site which produces um, less runoff than the current semi-cleared. So in other words, they would have to address more water than is currently leaving the site. The, um, uh, the proposal of the applicant to provide the infiltration facilities within the proposed road dedication or additional road dedication at the south end of the site. The uh, temporary detention pond um, would be um, constructed immediately to the north, and as the applicant noted, that would be uh, then its operation and maintenance would be done by the town and funded by the applicant. The question becomes then, um, why are we doing? Why is this coming forward to council in advance of the Northeast Comox Stormwater Management Plan? Northeast Comox Stormwater Management Plan the implementation uh, included the necessary cost recovery mechanisms. Um, as uh, the administrator noted, proposing that the bylaws come forward in approximately September, that would allow for their adoption by the end of the year. Um, after that, um, we'd actually have to do the pond construction to service that. So you're looking at well into 2019 before we have a pond constructed um, to service Northeast Comox. Um, the proposed development is an emergence is in the emerging industry. So you see a lot of big rush right now to get into that industry. Typically timing is of the essence in order to affect, um, to get the investment opportunities and the market opportunities. Um, so timing becomes critical. Um, the innovation center is the opportunity to actually attract investment in an emerging, emerging industry and create local employment for highly skilled specialists. Um, de dense find our economic base. The, as such, it presents a unique opportunity to achieve the OCP objective, um, to diversify the time, town's economic base and create new employment opportunities. A lot of OCPs will have wording like that in it, but really being able to achieve that is dependent on timing, site specifics. It's more or less if everything comes together and you have a proponent that is willing to invest uh, and has the funding to do so. And so as such, it's a, it's a very unique opportunity that's presented to the town. And hence the uh, proposal, proposed DVP application in advance of the stormwater management plan. Yeah, have you answered any questions? Questions from council? What's the short? Um, this doesn't pertain to this particular application, but it has occurred to me. With the larger stormwater management plan, 
Is the town, would the town be constructing the ponds? On the pond construction, yes. Okay. Okay. On the infiltration galleries, as in this, they would be constructed by development as they proceed in road dedication or park plan. So both facilities, um, they're new types. We don't have that experience with them. Um, they have to have an allowance for, we can change, we can increase their capacity by what, 10% or 20%? 20. 20%, so we can adjust if new information uh, comes forward. And the fact that they would be then on town-owned land and under town operations would mean that we would actually have, have the physical ability to enter on the property and do those adjustments. But two safeguards that we see as being key in this area. Thank you. Hmm. Do you have any other questions, comments? No? So we have not moved and seconded this, so we can get some more. I just move the recommendation. Yeah. Second. Yeah. And then discussion. We kind of already did that. Mm -hmm. And so, okay. all those in favor? And opposed? So that carries. And we'll move on to uh, Comox Valley Tele Coalition to End Homelessness. And this is to confirm our, con our contribution to uh, the Transition Society of $30,000. So, we'll move that. Yeah, move that. And so second. And discussion. No, I think we're doing a good thing of um, helping out uh, an important uh, initiative. All right. And any further? All those in favor? That's carried. We'll just wait a second while people clear out here, and then we can move on to correspondence. Association, dissolution of the Comox Town Residents Association. Barbara, do you want to make this motion? <laughs> to receive and to uh, just send them a letter to thank them for their work through the years. And, uh, I'll second that. Okay. All right, and then discussion. Do you want to send them a letter? I, I, I think it would, it would be great. They've done a wonderful service over 20 years, and almost 25 years of... Uh, but very respectful, I think, comment and uh, activism with a goal that I think we all support to, uh, to have a wonderful community here. And, um, yeah, and people move on and age, and a lot of societies uh, find that they can't manage to um, attract new younger people, and so uh, mark of our times, but uh, kudos to the work they did. I'm sure we can come up with a letter and send it off to them. So, uh, all those in favor? That's carried. Now we'll move on to Robert Dean Brooklyn Creek Watershed Shed Society Award for Brooklyn Creek Watershed Society. Second. And any discussion? I, I would I'd just like to make a comment. Uh, this certainly is a well-deserved award. The town and the Watershed Society have worked long and hard to accomplish many things, but the good news is that they do continue to work towards further improvements on Brooklyn Creek, some of which are hopefully are going to be quite substantial, just as much as those in the past. So, again, congratulations for them. All right. That's and, I, and I think it's good, and the letter does um, uh, mention, and uh, I think kudos to uh, Al Fraser, too, who's uh, worked long and hard and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, accomplished a huge amount and shows the, uh, the power of partnership <coughs> and we have good, really good staff who um, work well with community. I think that's a very good point. It's all working. Yeah. All right. All those in favor? And that's carried. And we'll move on to Wayne Tedder, uh, Royal Canadian Legion 2017 Poppy Campaign. For this Second. Second. And discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's carried. And we'll move on to our late item, which is bylaw 1876. One more before that. I don't know. What? Come on, Valley Regional District. Yeah. 
Okay, so it's uh, Jake Martin's Comox Valley Regional District uh, Water Committee voting structure for receipt. There's, there's also the, this is where we have to assign ah, votes okay. All right. uh, to the Water Committee directors. So one gets two votes, the other director gets one vote. Okay. And in the past, it's been Director Price. I have two. And you have had two, and Director Price has had one. So with the receipt motion, I move that uh, Director Grant continues with uh, two votes. I'll be just as powerful as one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we've got someone to second, second that motion. And discussion? Just a frustrated mm -hmm. observation, mm -hmm. I think, perhaps quite a uh, Given that the city of Courtney receives seven votes because they use more water, and the rest of us can do nothing about it because our total votes comes only to six. So is there any way that we could change or improve the qualifying requirements use for the support structure? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, if we use more water, 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 we can solve that. that. Yes. Well, but there must around. be another yeah. way. This is, no, it's seems, ridiculous. it is wrong. I'm sure the powers that be would <clears> certainly be able to come up with an answer that would serve us and the water supply better than this. Well, I can honestly say that, uh, that I have brought that argument to the table several times. Um, Courtney, of course, doesn't see it the same way we do, but I find it wrong that one group could dominate the entire service. Here, here. Um, and so I think that a better way has to be found, and yet, in order to find that better way, we need them to vote for it. So we're in a bit of a conundrum, but uh, Is there perhaps... Th there, there are some preliminary discussions that will occur, I believe it's early February, uh, around the whole notion of governance not only with water, but sewer and solid waste. So that may lead to some change to the system in the longer run. Mm -hmm. So, but yes, there is, there is a, um, a light at the end of the tunnel that's dripping a little bit of water. <laughs> Does that make any yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we figured it out. Well, so you brought up the notion of the regional district of the utilities commission to change the structure because that board would be made up of professionals rather than elected officials. And take the so politics that's out of it where hoping to take the politics right out of it. So um, that's an ongoing discussion as well. Excellent. So, oh good. Well this yeah. is encouraging. Things things go slowly though. <laughs> they do have no. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Price. And a good point you make. The wheels of government move very slowly, but the good thing is they do move. And um, uh, as Richard points out, there is going to be discussion on how we can move forward with this. And uh, already set up is a dispute resolution process so that if, if it did ever happen that um, our worst fears came to fruition, that a vote happened that everyone else opposed, there is process that at least can bring it to the table and, uh, and discuss it. In so that, that's the best we've got so far. Well, that's a good step. It's a long way from perfect, but it's heading in that direction. Yeah, no, we have not that. And so anything else? And then all those in favor? And that's carried. And now can we move on to the layout? Yes. All right. <laughs> so we have uh, bylaw 1876, Comox Water Rates and Regulations, bylaw amendment number 24 for first, second, and third reading. Is that Second. Yes. And discussion. <coughs> Seeing no hands, all those in favor? That's carried. Uh, delegation so reports from member of council. Why don't we just go around the ring, Councillor Grant? Oh, he's not here. <laughs> yes. The other one. Uh, I have the a better looking one can go first. <laughs> uh, I have a short report. Uh, I attended the economic forecasting that was presented by the Chamber of Commerce, found it very informative, a good morning, and also the seniors report. We have a now a membership of over 650 people. Some of that is renewal and many of them are new people coming to Dallas. So our, our little facility over there is being well used. And that's all I have. Councilor McKinnon. Yes, uh, very briefly as well, I attended a homeless coalition meeting 
I went to the Economic Development Breakfast and put on the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I met with our rec new Recreation Director about Pacific Sport Physical Literacy, which we covered today in Council meeting, and I'm pleased to see that that's uh, being followed up. Uh, and finally, um, I'm off to the Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities Regional Library Board during this Saturday in the Nile. Nice. Councillor, I want to call you Director again, <laughs> Councillor Price. Yes, sir. I attended two Integrated Regional Transportation Select Committee meetings, and uh, we will be getting a presentation on the proposed um, multi-use trail at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, I attended um, an AVICC meeting and uh, also an executive teleconference. I attended Ruth Masters Celebration of Life. I chaired the co-management meeting of the North East Comox Wildlife Management Area and uh, also attended the Sewage Commission where I was elected chair. Um, on the Sewage Commission um, we did uh, look at biosolids uh, and upgrade is necessary which is going to be about 1.3 million uh, to um, upgrade the biosolids compost facility. Um, we are also looking at asset management. Um, the combined uh, total for the asset management is 335 or nearly 336,000 of which 77,000 would be for the sewer service, uh, but also looking for grants of uh, about 65,000 to offset some of that. Uh, the odour control measures for the uh, treatment plant um, will be, uh, the work will hopefully be completed by May and hopefully uh, we will have a future without complaints and uh, the neighbourhood can enjoy the enjoyment of their homes and uh, without uh, having to deal with the uh, with older problems. Uh, I also attended the uh, Regional District Committee of the Whole. We had a presentation from DC Assessment. Um, about 80% uh, of our properties here have uh, a 10 to 20% increase in residential value. Uh, the um, the Committee of the Whole supported the Community Health Network um, in the Comox Valley. Uh, they are uh, going to get a grant of 80000 a year for three years from Island Health and the uh, uh, Regional District is looking to administer the, uh, the money uh, with a small fee and um, we will also be getting a report on how we can work together. There were concerns that uh, we don't want to be taking on additional costs, uh, taxpayer-based costs, uh, but it does seem that we can be a support agent for this group and um, with, with minimal costs to the taxpayers. And uh, it's certainly something I think that could have uh, uh, a great um, benefit in that it breaks through the silos that we see in terms of um, and the issues we have out there, and many of them are uh, community-based issues, transportation, homelessness, and uh, uh, so I, I think that's a really good day for the Valley. It, it, uh, just to interrupt you for a second, it won't be a regional district function, it no. will simply be a flow-through, so yeah. we're not starting any function there. Uh, we also had a presentation on the Lazo Creek watershed drainage. Um, which is uh, the Queen's Ditch and the, the problems that we were alluded to with our uh, first presentation. A <coughs> um, number of um, solutions are being looked at. The one that seems to be the most promising is uh, returning areas to wetland. Uh, it seems to be in the long term the most cost effective because of the, the low maintenance cost, but uh, we'll have to see about the the buy-in from the area because it would uh, it would be a relatively uh, large amount of wetland to offset the problem that we have there. And then we went into the financial planning process and um, started out. Altogether, <coughs> the regional district has 102 services, of which uh, Comox is in is in 22. 
And at this point uh, in the early deliberations, a property assessed at 400,000 uh, would see an increase of $3.78. Uh, that doesn't include the sewer and water. And uh, this is before we really sharpened our pencils. And that is my report. Thank you. Director Swift. Or, oh. Sorry, Councillor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I attended the uh, Chamber of Commerce Economic Forecasting Breakfast, and it was great, very interesting. I attended the Felberg Board Meeting, just a regular meeting, and the Sewage Commission Meeting yesterday. Perfect. And then Councillor Arnott. Yes, um, I attended last night a BIA meeting. Um, they're still uh, jockeying around who's going to take over the uh, President and Vice President of it. Uh, I'm sure by next meeting we'll know that. Um, I asked them how they felt about the Christmas decorations this year, allow the street, the tree, and uh, they wanted to pass on their things to the town of Comox for that. It looked good. Um, one overwhelming comment was that I'd like to see the words Merry Christmas up the hill as opposed to perhaps Happy Holidays. Here, here. I yeah. heard that yeah. many times. And, uh, yes. and that was, uh, that came across strong. Um, they had mentioned the beefs and bouquets, and with all due respect to the newspaper, <coughs> I don't read those, but uh, I guess there was a... Uh, but did this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a lot on there, I was told. So um, maybe that's something we can talk about over the year as Christmas comes around again. Um, as many know, uh, Twisted Dishes has closed, and... Um, Rocky Mountain Cafe is looking at uh, moving in there and having some sort of cafe. Uh, whether it's going to be Rocky Mountain or, or a different a different name is unknown, but uh, David Gann, who's uh, doing quite well in the area with Rocky Mountain, and he opened up uh, two new restaurants in uh, both uh, the hospitals in Comox, a very important in the Campbell River. So he uh, will have something there soon. Um, one of the offshoots of the BIA is um, talking with Sue Wood, who's the uh, production person for Nautical Days, and, and this does tie in with BIA, is that um, they're going to be, Sue and John Mang are going to be looking at uh, um, getting out, out of the production of the uh, of Nautical Days. So they're hoping that this summer we can have somebody part of a succession plan, sit in with them, get an idea of what's going on because after this uh, they'll be done and uh, they want to make this year a good one. I believe this is the 60th anniversary of town being incorporated so um, they, uh, they want to go out with a bang. So, um, Not an incorporation though, of the nautical days. Uh, what is it? We incorporated. We had that 60th. We had that. that was yeah, yeah, okay, so it must be the 60th yeah. nautical days. Yes. Yeah. Is it nautical days? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so with that, they uh, they they asked that we start looking at that at a staff level of how we're going to move forward with that. Um, and that would be it. Well, thank you. That's. That's uh, kind of too bad. They've done a really good job, so mm -hmm. hopefully we can find somebody adequate to replace them. But um, mm -hmm. as for myself, I attended the sewer commission meeting and the regional district meeting. I think Barbie, I had it all written out. I think you hit all the points there. So um, the only thing I would say is I gave Shelley a copy of the preliminary budget from the regional district, so you can see the services that we're dealing with and the actual increase that they're talking about. Of course, it doesn't include sewer and water, so. That would be my report, and then we would go to questions from the media. All good, and questions from the public. I could say, uh, did you know, but I think you do know because Councillor Anna mentioned the sign at the top of the hill. So I'd just like to uh, reiterate and add that I've been approached by a number of people, quite a few people, are not pleased by the sentiment. So, do you have any thoughts on some way of rectifying that? Well, that is a question. <laughs> well, we'll take that to staff and see what the outcome of that could be. Um, you know, I, I heard the same comments on, yeah. on several occasions, so I think it's something we can deal with over the year and see if we can find a solution to that. So, leave it at that. And with that, uh, motion to adjourn. Move. So moved.